Good morning. Oh, hi, Xander. Oh, here's my monogram for the day. I'm going to get credit for that. It was a struggle this morning, you know. Hi, Maggie. I have, uh, I have shoes that match my be still and know that I'm God shirt that are monogram, but I'm not really wearing shoes because, you know. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Ella. Good morning, Max. My sweet family. Good afternoon. No, Harry. No. Nobody cares that you're not in Kentucky. We are all morning people. Oh, brothers and sisters, that's nice. That's nice. All right. So, uh, my assumption is you guys have gotten through your um, quizzes. I'm going to check that after we're done and uh, get those grades put in. Oh, I gotta turn this off. Okay. And I gotta see my. There we go. Okay. So, um, just wanna reiterate we're still looking at a 45 minute test at home for us. I started working on chapter 15, which is um, titled Non Renewable Energy. And let me tell y'all, it is as exciting as it sounds. Uh, we're going to know more about oil than I thought possible. I learned a lot yesterday as I struggled through it. And uh, I know what cracking is now. Um, not what I thought it was. <laughs> so um, I know what petrochemicals are now. And you are going to as well. And so... That's where we're headed next is evidently we need to know a whole lot more about uh, renewable and non-renewable energy sources. So that's what we're going to do. I've gotten up this morning. Chad and I have ran four miles. And so hopefully Rosie is a little more subdued. It is a beautiful, going to be a beautiful 72, 74 degree day. So I hope you guys all get out and get in this uh, with social distancing. I got an email from the health park and they're wanting me to go and do like a follow-up CPR certification thing. And uh, <laughs> that's what I do, Caleb. And I just don't know how I feel about that. Like, do they want to, if they think I'm going to blow on that doll, that they are, like, for real crazy. So, I just, I've got to think about how I'm going to approach this. Am I going to just walk in there and be like, um, I realize that you guys are, like, a hospital and such, but this is not how we do things. Like, we do not, in the middle of a pandemic, all share at all. Um, I don't know. Do I have faith that they're going to do the right thing and just. Do as I'm told? Do I call somebody and say, what you talking about, Willis? Oh, that would be, a, yeah, you guys won't know what that even meant. But at any rate, um, so that's kind of what I've had this morning is we've gotten up, we've gotten Ace on. He's already had history and math, and uh, I've had Rosie and Chad out, and we went for a run, and now it's time to talk to some of my favorite people on the planet, and uh, then sit down and focus on oil and gas and it's bad i found myself rubbing my hands a lot um but i think i'm going to be able to put it down into a, a consumable chunk like i do for you guys and, and we're going to do great oh good morning logan um oh xander you did get it i swear you may have been born at the wrong time oh look at there kayla all right all right, there you go. Um, very good. Good to hear. So, <laughs> Chad and Rosie are, are huffing and trying to communicate via hand signals, which is pretty funny. Rosie's bad at it, better at it than, than Chad is, but um, there you go. All right, so, 
How should we deal with air pollution? Uh, this is an actual um, picture from, gosh, I want to say this was before the Clean Air Act. So, if memory serves right, <laughs> uh, Kaylee, they're talking about, what you talking about, Lilith? Um, just, it's okay. You can Google it later. Yes, thank you, Logan. So, um, the Clean Air Act, again, I think is, is a law that you're going to have to be familiar with. I told you guys I was going to look yesterday, and then I lied to you, and I did not. I apologize. Um, I just got all wrapped up in this non-renewable situation, and, and that's the Hades that I stayed in for the rest of the day. So if memory serves, this is one of the, they narrowed the laws down, which is fantastic. Last year I had the kids do, like, pick out your top 20 and memorize them. Just like, you know, we're just hoping that you pick the right one that's going to be on there. And I think now they've narrowed it down, but I do believe this is one of them that is on there. So the federal government established air pollution regulations for key pollutants that are enforced by states and major cities. So the one thing I want to say about... Well, the couple of things I want to say about clean air acts and laws in general before we get started are, are they good? Yes. Um, are regulations good? Well, they can be. Um, they, uh, yes, the show is called Different Strokes. Um, but with the regulations, just like we were talking about with coal mining, um, with all the regulations that have been made, up goes the price, right? So um, it it does have an impact overall on our society. So there are the good impact is clearly sorry my nose is itching. Clean air, we all appreciate that. We've talked about you know um, birth defects, decline in health, decline in AQ. Dang it, Kaylee, decline in IQ. We're not going to talk about crazy stuff today, Kaylee Payne. So, um, it is, it, 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 it's bad, you know, polluted air is bad, clean air is good, but the trade-off is we're going to pay for it, right? You don't just get it. There are trade-offs. So, let's take a look at this. I want to say this is, yeah, it'll be okay, I promise. The Clean Air Act of 1970 is regarded as the most comprehensive air pollution control bill in American history. It was a response in large part to the American public's urgent call for action to address what it saw as an environmental state of emergency. And it was the product of a strong and committed bipartisan effort in Congress. The consensus was overwhelming. It was time to place the protection of our air, water, and land on the forefront of our national agenda. What was the foundation for that commitment? How and why did it come about? And most important, what can we learn from it? The popular environmental movement began in the 1960s. Scientist and writer Rachel Carson published Silent Spring in 1962. The controversial book, along with a number of other high-profile events, served to rouse public awareness toward a wide range of human health and environmental issues. But perhaps no event gained more attention as effectively and dramatically as Earth Day. On April 22, 1970, 20 million people mobilized for the first nationwide demonstrations on environmental problems. Congress adjourned for the day so members could attend Earth Day events in their districts. The response was nothing short of remarkable. What's more, it came at a time when members of the Senate were considering what to do about the nation's poor air quality. Earth Day helped to build political momentum for a tough new law. Democratic Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine was at the helm of the Air and Water Pollution Subcommittee. He had little doubt that passage of clean air legislation would be a formidable challenge given the reluctance of President Richard Nixon and the all-out resistance of industry. Congress, too, posed something of a hurdle. 
Many members still weren't convinced of the need for a national strategy to control pollution. But Chairman Muskie found a strong ally in Republican Senator Howard Baker of Tennessee. Although Senator Baker disliked the idea of regulating private industry, he was convinced that federal standards and federal action were the only way to bring about genuine improvements in air quality. Senator Baker sided with Chairman Muskie on an emissions control approach to pollution, in which Congress was charged with setting the standards. At the insistence of Chairman Muskie, the standards were based on hard science, not economics, not politics. Democratic Senator Tom Eagleton supported the Muskie-Baker plan. However, he was skeptical of the grand promises that Congress and the President so often made. He believed the American people deserved to know when they could expect results. To accommodate Senator Eagleton's concerns, deadlines for government action were incorporated into the law, and many of those government actions were made mandatory rather than permissive. Senator Baker went along with the idea of deadlines, but he had his reservations. Did industry actually have the technology capable to meet them? General Motors President Edward Cole answered the question for him. Noting his company's progress with the catalytic converter, Cole provided assurance that the anti-pollution device could be installed in every new car made in just a few years. Senator Baker was convinced, so much so that the Muskie-Baker plan now included the concept of technology forcing. That is, standards would be set so as to force industry to develop and employ the best technology that was available to them. At this point, the Muskie-Baker plan was widely accepted. The team had gone the additional mile to give citizens, environmental organizations, and state agencies the authority to bring lawsuits against violators to ensure that the provisions of the act were implemented and enforced over the years. The Clean Air Act of 1970 was truly groundbreaking, covering territory that had never before been legislated. And yet, when put before the full Senate, the bill passed unanimously. No one would claim that the Clean Air Act of 1970 achieved all of its ambitious objectives. Deadlines had to be extended, technology did not always keep pace, and polluters often worked to frustrate the law first rather than comply with it, thus wasting precious time and hindering progress. But the real success of the Clean Air Act is that it served as a model for future legislation. It moved environmental protection concerns to a prominent position on the national agenda, where, by and large, they have remained ever since. Perhaps it was the climate of the times. Perhaps it was something in the water, or the air for that matter. Whatever was behind the momentum, the passage of the Clean Air Act of 1970 demonstrates what can be achieved when compromise, concession, and consensus dictate. When different viewpoints are valued and respected, and when parties and politics are put aside, and decisions are made based on what is in the best interest of the country as a whole. Okay, oh, okay. So, um, a couple of things that she talked about that we want to talk about are, um, she used the word bipartisan, so we need to talk about what does the word bipartisan mean? That's right, it means both sides of the aisle, so they call it. So Democrats and Republicans both agreed um, to a certain extent that this was the right thing to do. Uh, one of the things that really jump out at you about this bill is that it forced the automotive industry to use like the most current technology, the most current um, equipment, I guess you would say. So, you know, on, on the surface, like a lot of things, that sounds very good, is that we need to use the most current things that are going to help with uh, keeping our air clean, because clean air is great, but then if you look at that from the automotive industry, that means that about the time that you get the line up and rolling with this machinery with this technology you've made your price point at this level they come up with new technology and you are now required 
to include it. You know, you no longer have the option to say, well, we'll make cars at this level, this level, and this level. So I feel like that that probably was in the original in 1970 and that that has been finagled a little bit because we do know, or they've just found ways around it because we know that we have hybrid cars, we have full electric cars, we have smart cars. Um, I, I, it's the te I guess the Tesla is an electric car. Um, so we now know that there are options for how we, oh gosh, diesels. I almost forgot about diesels. They I think they do still make diesel cars. I think, um, you know, I think 18 wheelers run on diesel. So there's options out there. So Congress, uh, directed the EPA to establish air quality standards for the six major air pollutants. And these are the ones that you just, uh, of all the ones, remember, we talk about, you don't want to just say air pollution. You want to be able to point to one. So you want to be able to say carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. Oh, carbon dioxide isn't even on there. That's silly. Um, carbon dioxide. That is definitely one. Um, sulfur dioxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, lead, particulate matters, ozone. Now, remember, that's ground level ozone. That's the bad ozone. Uh, good ozone is up in our what fear? Stratosphere, that's right. So one limit called the primary standard is set to protect all human health. So what we're saying is, what our primary standard is we just want to protect people. Another limit called the secondary standard is intent to prevent environmental and property damage. So um, if you could hit both, that's optimal, right? Um, but your primary standard is to protect human health and then environmental and property damage. Um, the EPA has also established national emission standards for more than 188 hazardous air pollutants, and those are called HAPS, hazardous air, hazardous air pollutants. Um, so these are ones that the EPA has said this could cause harm to you. Now, what do we know about a pollutant? A pollutant can be anything, right? Anything that can cause harm. But we've identified 188. Um, so most are chlorinated hydrocarbons, VOCs, or compounds of toxic metals. And you can check the toxic release inventory. There's your TRI you guys are asking me about to see how your community is doing. Um, you can see that Kentucky is smack dab in the middle, um, low end of the middle, right? So our neighbors to the north and south are doing worse. And then, of course, you know, West Virginia. They sure do seem to be all stars these days. So the good news is the 2012 EPA report combined the emissions of six major pollutions to say that they had decreased by 63%. So we're doing a good job of uh, having good air quality, protecting our air quality. Um, and even with this significant increase, our gross domestic product went up 128%. Vehicle miles traveled went up 94%. Energy consumption went up 26%. And our population went up 37%. Now, that, again, on the surface doesn't sound like much, but it's huge. So that means... We have, more, we have more people doing more stuff, traveling more places, making and consuming and buying more things. And yet still, in light of all of that, we went down 63%. So that's amazing. Like we, we as Americans are doing such a good job. I just cannot say enough. Stop saying you're sorry. Stop apologizing for being... An American and all the terrible things that Americans are, we are pretty freaking awesome most of the time. I mean, like, well, there's a few sore hits, but we're pretty good. Um, emissions during this period dropped. I say, okay, so lead, clearly, we pretty much got rid of that. Like, that lead was bad. Particulate matters, um, 0.10, 10% are down. Carbon dioxide is down. I mean, look at that. Pretty cool stuff. Um, in 2013, the EPA proposed stricter motor vehicle emission standards that would reduce emissions of volatile organic chemicals and nitrogen oxides by 80% and particular emissions by 70%. So because they have done this, again, let's talk about the pros and the cons. The pros are these good things have happened with our newer model 
cars. The con is the price has gone, yes, up. So um, that's pros and cons. So once again, we are eliminating a group of the population by no longer being able to offer them a vehicle that is um, affordable, right? Like, it's just crazy. As you guys are on the cusp of, you know, getting your driver's license and earning your freedom, think about how much money that's going to cost to get you a new car, uh, just a reg like a regular car. I don't know that many of you are going to get a brand new car. Most of you are going to get a used car. Um, so that opens the door for another conversation. So a lot of people that are in poverty are, dr are driving those older model vehicles that don't have these same standards and emissions on them. So they are still out there um, on the road. As the EPA estimates, the death toll from outdoor air pollution uh, will be reduced by, let's see, yeah, by 2,000. Reduced respiratory ailments in children by 23,000. Estimate a saving of $7 in health care for every dollar spent, which is huge. And promised gas would only increase by one cent per gallon. All right, so here's where we got to uh, pump the brakes a little bit. So I remember sitting in my living room, which I am now, and uh, shaking my head because when I was 16, when I was your all's age, first of all, could not wait to get my driver's license, could not wait to get out on the road and be free, and we didn't have cell phones. So, like, you just, when you were out, you were just out. Nobody could get you. Nobody could text you. It was just you and the radio and the window rolled down. And where, where are you going to go? Hard to say. And with my geographical advancements, you know, I did end up in some awkward places. But we cruised. That's all we did. We drove and we drove and we drove and we drove. Um, didn't know where we were going most of the time. We just drove. Um, why could we do that? Because it was cheap, right? Gas was less than a dollar a gallon. So if you had $10... I mean, you were set. You could just drive and drive and drive and drive and drive and drive and drive. And, drive. and um, it was lovely. And then I remember um, I was married. So I would have been at least 24 when uh, gas, the gas prices really started to increase. And I want to pause here and say it wasn't just because of this, these new laws that were passed. There was also conflict in the Middle East that increased gas prices right but that was the big promise is that gas prices weren't going to go up so i got married in the year 2000 so this is 2005 um, and i remember talking to my father-in-law and saying they think that i'm going to get used to getting gas at two dollars a gallon and i'm not like this is ridiculous this is crazy and then Sure enough, out of nowhere, there's Rosie. I got accustomed to buying gas at $2 a gallon. Like, it just happened. We went from less than a dollar to sometimes $2.50 here in Owensboro to get gas, um, which is crazy. And that's, um, so why are gas prices low at this time? You know, I don't know. My husband and I, we were just talking about that. <laughs> Rose. Oh, she's <laughs> so Chad has to call all of his team members because Toyota has extended their shutdown for another two weeks. Well, everyone, I mean, oh, yeah. He's chasing the dog. Hey, you just heard we're <laughs> Um, they come and help us. So Chad is trying to 
Chad's trying to talk to his people. I'm trying to talk to my people. And the dog is just running crazy. And Chad's trying to catch her. And she is just... <laughs> she's just going crazy. Um, so, now Ace is, in this, Ace is in the mix of things now. So, things should get better quick. Um, so... Okay, so Luke has uh, sounded in and said lower demand, and Xander says our dollar is worth more right now, and it's the combination of the two. And then Luke says, I bet we're going to get major inflation pretty soon, and uh, and we very well could. Uh, this is we're certainly in an unknown time, right? Like this is special. And this is isolated. And I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I haven't gone anywhere. I've not gone anywhere. We, I run, I, you know, we go out and we exercise outside because they say it's okay to do that. I haven't ordered food. I, have, I haven't gone anywhere. And so I just happened to look up. And then um, I saw that the gas prices were so low. And it was news to me. And I watch Fox News so much, and I'll be honest with you, there's been just, it's just COVID-19, COVID-19, so they're not really talking about anything else but COVID-19, so I haven't really heard much about why, um, why it's all, why it is so, so low, um, but during this time period that we're looking at right here, I can tell you, this is an average, so I want to draw your attention to the fact that it is an average. Um, when you went to places like New York City, Chicago, L.A., you could have paid upwards of 4 to $6 a gallon. Um, like you can see in 2008 there, for you to get an average of $4 a gallon, you know that others had to be making way, you know, paying way more a gallon. Um, yes, I love that you guys are having a conversation about inflation and stuff. That makes my heart very happy. Um, environmental scientists applaud the success, but they call for strengthening U.S. air pollution laws by putting much greater emphasis on preventing air pollution. So, my loves, as I tell you, when you are writing, which you will be writing, um, you will be asked to offer a solution, to offer a proposal. Um, and I'm telling you, prevention is always going to be the right answer, but... You're going to, I think you're going to look more educated and you're going to sound more solid if you can put in there that you understand that prevention costs more up front, right? It caught, that's why we don't just, like we were talking about yesterday with the refrigerators, right? So, um, are we ever going to reach a point? Oh, here we go. Gas prices across the country largely due to two factors. Fears over coronavirus are causing less people to travel and... An international oil dispute has led to a plunge. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Um, so, will the environmentalists ever be satisfied? I'm going to say no. Um, do we need people out there beating that drum and saying, do better, do better, do better? Sure. Um, sharply reducing emissions from older coal-burning power in industrial plants, cement plants, oil refineries, and waste incinerators are one of the things that they want to get rid of, which, heart of Kentucky, right there you are. Um, you know, Ohio County, Muhlenberg County, I don't know. There is, a, there is a coal mine in McLean County now, but during the coal boom, I don't think there was. Um, but this, this hit the heart of our state. Um... They also want to continue to improve fuel efficiency standards for motor vehicles. And clearly, I'm going to pick the Toyota. Um, I love this guy. <laughs> like, I don't mow the yard because, you know, I'm a girl. Uh, but I, if I did mow the yard, I'm not sure I wouldn't try to mow it like that. <laughs> Um, so they also want us to regulate more strictly the emissions of motorcycles to cycle gasoline engines, which 
Um, you know, when I read that, I was like, I don't know what a two-cycle gas engine is, but then it said chainsaw, lawnmowers, generators, scooters, snowmobiles, um, and the typical riding gas-powered lawnmower for an hour creates as much air pollution as driving 34 cars for an hour. Like, it, I, don't, I don't know, guys. It's like every, the smarter we get, right? I know. That could be true. So, uh, lawnmowers, like, who knew? Like, who knew that they were that bad? I didn't, uh, but they are. So, understand that if you think that you're still doing okay because you're not mowing the yard, you're not clear yet, they also don't want you to take a cruise. And evidently, neither does COVID-19. So, they uh, want airports and ocean-going ships also to reduce their... Emissions. Okay. Um, sharply reducing indoor air pollution. And we've talked about that. So I picked this picture because remember, one of the best ways that we can reduce indoor air pollution is ventilation, right? So I tried to pick a picture that had a ton of windows to invoke that. Executives of companies would be affected by implementing stronger air pollution regulations, and they claim that correcting these problems would cost too much and it would hinder economic growth. And I, that's that's just always got to be in your mind, in my opinion, is you just, you know, people who drive the, drive the boat off the cliff that say, you know, oh, there's a dog out there dragging a little boat by the street. <laughs> okay. Um, that just drive that cliff off of, you know, I'll be danged. Let's just, you know get rid of this and get rid of this and get rid of this, you know, and then they complain because, you know, we don't have, we can't afford to have all of those things thrown out of our society and continue to function as a society. Um, so proponents of stronger air pollution regulations contend that history has shown that the most industry cost estimates for implant implementing U.S. air pollution control standards have been much higher than they actually proved to be. So what they're saying is, you know, you guys said it was going to cost too much to do, but then you found a way to do it and still make a dollar. So implementing such standards has helped some companies to create jobs by stimulating them to develop a new pollution control technologies. And some of your parents may have jobs where that is their job, is to run around uh, a business and help them stay EPA compliant, right? So that is true. It does create other jobs. Um, let's see. We can use the marketplace to reduce out outdoor air pollution. I don't remember what this one is. I just ran across a rather disturbing statistic. Apparently, Americans have no idea what cap and trade is. When Rasmussen asked America, I just ran across a rather disturbing statistic. Apparently, Americans have no idea what cap and trade is. When Rasmussen asked Americans what cap and trade was, most of them had no idea, and 29% of them said that it had something to do with regulatory reform on Wall Street. Only 24% said that it had anything to do with environmental issues. I thought maybe this eco geek could be of some service. Now you probably know what cap and trade is, but maybe you need a refresher course, and maybe you just want to share with your friends and family, so they too can have some idea about the most important environmental legislation ever. So, cap and trade, in its simplest form, basically the government says to all of the companies in the country, we can only have this much of a certain pollutant. Well, that's the cap. We simply cannot have more than that much pollution, and if we do, we're gonna fine the crap out of all of you. Then the government distributes credits for the release of those pollutants to all of the companies that produce those pollutants. Ideally, they give the companies credits for less pollution than they're already polluting with, so then the companies either have to reduce their pollution or buy credits from someone else. If the company is able to reduce its pollution below its current credit level, then it can sell or trade away those credits to companies that are having a harder time. So basically, the government creates an artificial economic market in pollution. So then the amount of money that the companies are willing to spend decreasing their pollution is directly proportional to the amount of money it would cost them to buy the credits if they weren't able to reduce their pollution. Success! We have a new economic market and everyone wants to reduce their pollution!
Wait, there are problems? We run into the first problem when we say that the credits are distributed. How are they distributed? There are two ways. Basically, there's grandfathering. And would you get credits based on the amount of pollution you're already producing? Which seems kind of lame to me. I mean, it's like, oh, you're the biggest polluter. Here, have the largest number of credits. Or two, they can be auctioned off. That's the way that the Obama administration is looking at doing it. They're actually hoping to have a huge amount of money generated by the auctioning off of these carbon credits. But economists are kind of like, wait a second. So you've created an artificial market and you're selling nothing for billions of dollars. Also, the polluting corporations don't like it at all. But to me, it seems like a fairly fair way to do things. The second problem with cap and trade is that, yes, the money has to come from somewhere. So whatever sectors of the economy are doing all that pollution, the prices of their services are going to go up. So yes, gasoline prices and energy prices would increase. And if gasoline and energy prices are increasing, what we have, it's not a cap and trade system, it's a tax. It's a tax. Boo, taxes! Rah, rah, rah! I like my money! Don't take my money away! But it's certainly more popular than a straight carbon tax, and with good reason. First, we don't have to call it a tax, and people like that. Second, say there's one coal power plant that can reduce its emissions relatively easily, and there's another in which it would be extremely expensive to reduce its emissions. The coal plant that has an easy time can reduce its emissions twice over, and the coal plant that's having a hard time doesn't have to do it. So you get the same amount of reduction in the end, but the costs are much lower. Cap and trade systems have actually been used in America for a long time, mostly on sulfur dioxide, which is the stuff that causes acid rain. And since cap and trade legislation went into place on sulfur dioxide, energy prices have not increased substantially, but the emission of sulfur dioxide has gone down like 50% despite huge increases in power generation. So yes! It works! Well, it works for sulfur dioxide anyway. The question is, will it work for greenhouse gases? Hopefully, we will find out soon. The Obama administration hopes to have cap and trade legislation on the books by 2012. And from then on, the government can continually lower the cap, and that strong market in carbon credits should spur an event. It's like you cannot teach them about cap and trade. Okay, good. Um, yes, they did implement it, so. <laughs> um, good, thank you, Max. Um, they did implement it, so of course, as in always, they found a way around with cap and trade. Um, so bigger corporate companies were buying up smaller shell corporations, um, and they were buying those and, and getting those those credits. So the like one of the big things about cap and trade is that it once again uh hurts the little guy, it hurts the small business owner, and the large companies go right on. Now, <laughs> so um, there are, there were some pretty big holes in, in the, in the whole system, but that, but on, on a, just on a purely theoretical platform, I feel like they may ask you, what is cap and trade? And it's just, just so, just as long as you can talk about, like, we put a cap on it, and then you guys are able to move around with, as long as you stay, as long as everybody stays underneath that umbrella, I think you'll be in good shape. So, there are many ways to reduce outdoor air pollution. Uh, so, prevention, we burn low, sul low sulfur coal, which is not Kentucky coal, um, or remove the sulfur, which is very costly. We convert coal to a liquid or gaseous fuel, and then we shift to less polluting energy sources. So these are all of those renewable energy sources that we're going to talk about. And then, um, <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear her gallop through, but like I can hear it through my microphone. <laughs> it makes me giggle. Um, so, tax each unit of pollution produced um, is another for outdoor. For indoor, um, one of the big things is, which we have done, ban indoor smoking. Uh, set stricter from out high emission standards for carpet, furniture, and building materials. Prevent radon infiltration. And use less polluting cleaning agents, paints, and other products. So, some of your parents may use some of those all-green cleaning products. That's one of the things that they... Um, have okay so Kaylee has two questions and then um but the the biggest for the cleanup I, I'm sure it's on here is open your windows open your doors um have good airflow going through your home that helps the biggest all right so how have we depleted ozone in the stratosphere and what can we do about it 
So how do you remove the sulfur? I don't know what's, which sulfur you're talking Oh, in the coal? I don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's not like with a toothbrush. So it's really expensive. That's why that they ended up shutting down the coal mines in um, Kentucky. It's because it's called dirty coal. Um, there you go, Harry. Um, so when you, when you look at, so, and remember we talked about because Kentucky has dirty coal, we're not allowed to burn our own coal. Like Kentucky's not allowed to burn its own coal, but we're shipping it to China and they're burning our coal. So, all right. Ozone, here we go. Um, you have UVA, UVB, and UVC rays. Now, your book only focuses on UVA and UVB, um, but there is also UVC. It is the shortest wavelength, and it's absorbed. Uh, we keep out 95% of the harmful UV rays with our ozone. Um, A is the longest. It reaches deep into the layers of the skin, and that's what causes wrinkles and aging. B is what causes skin cancer, burning, and redness. So B is bad, right? Nobody likes aging. Nobody likes wrinkles, um, but B is bad, right? Cancers, you can think B benign. That's what you hope for. Anytime, anytime you burn, you increase your chances of having skin cancer. So in 1984, we found a hole. I'm telling y'all, the world was going to end. It was like the biggest scene of Chicken Little ever. So scientists discovered that each year, 40 to 50% of the ozone in the upper stratosphere over Antarctica was disappearing during September and October. So we followed this trend for, uh, we, we followed the hole, right, and gathered some data. So when it first hit, it was for real, we're all going to die. Um, and then... After we did some studying, we realized, oh, okay, well, maybe we may have jumped the gun just a little bit on there. So ozone hole is now technically incorrect. We uh, now call it ozone thinning. And I think this is a video that's going to show you what it looks like um, with over the months. And lots of great patterns. A gas called ozone surrounds the planet. The ozone layer acts 15 to 35 kilometers above Earth's surface. A gas called ozone surrounds the planet. The ozone layer acts as a barrier between Earth and ultraviolet radiation from the sun. However, pollution has caused the ozone layer to thin, exposing life on Earth to dangerous radiation. atmosphere is made up of six layers. The second layer, called the stratosphere, contains the ozone layer. The ozone layer is made up of a highly reactive molecule called ozone, which contains three oxygen atoms. Ozone is a trace gas in the atmosphere. There are only about three molecules for every 10 million molecules of air. But, it does a very important job. The ozone layer acts as Earth's sunscreen, absorbing about 98% of damaging ultraviolet or UV light. But the ozone layer has gotten thinner. Chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, are the primary culprits in ozone layer breakdown. A CFC is a molecule that contains the elements carbon, chlorine, and fluorine. CFCs are mostly found in refrigerants, aerosols, and plastic products. When CFCs are exposed to ultraviolet rays in the atmosphere, they break down into substances that include chlorine. The chlorine reacts with the oxygen atoms in ozone and rips apart the ozone molecule. 
Areas of damage in the ozone layer are often called ozone holes, but that name is misleading. Ozone layer damage is more like a thin patch with the thinnest areas near the poles. The ozone layer above the Antarctic in particular has been impacted by pollution since the mid-1980s. There, the region's low temperatures speed up the conversion of CFCs to ozone-damaging chlorine. About 90% of CFCs currently in the atmosphere were emitted by industrialized countries in the Northern Hemisphere. In 1989, the Montreal Protocol banned the production of ozone-depleting substances. Since then, the amount of chlorine and other ozone-depleting elements in the atmosphere have been falling. Scientists estimate that chlorine levels will return to their natural state in about 50 years. By then, the Antarctic ozone hole will shrink to smaller than 8 million square miles. Okay, so... Oh, stop. So, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, um, are bad, and you need to just be willing to say that. Um, we used to use things like um, uh, coolants for your air conditioners. You could go to Walmart, Kmart. Um, Kaylee wants to know why is it thin around the post? Well, just what she said, because of the temperatures, the cooler temperatures allows for the chlorofluorocarbons to do more damage, right? So, it was chemically unreactive, odorless, non-flammable, non-toxic, non-corrosive, inexpensive. It was good, right? Like, as far as anybody could tell, it was good. This should sound pretty familiar. This sounds a lot to me like DDT, right? It's cheap, it's efficient, it's, it's unreactive. They had no idea that it was headed to the, it was headed up into the stratosphere and that the chlorine in the CFC was going to do so much damage. So, things you're going to have to be able to do. You're going to have to be able to tell me where do you find chlorofluorocarbons. And the answer is you would find them in anything that was a refrigerant, right? Anything that is a coolant had chlor had a CFC involved in it. Um, anything that was a propellant, like an aerosol can. So, think about the 80s hair, all that big hair. Guys, it did not stand on its own. You know, you had to aquanet that up. So, um, all of our Freons, all of our aerosol cans, fumigants for granaries, ship cargo holds, gases used to make foam insulation and packaging. I'm telling you, my understanding was chlorofluorocarbons were everywhere. So, um, once again, we flipped out and we banned CFCs. So, you know, uh, you can no longer, like now, if your air conditioner is going out in your car, you have to go to, you know, um, uh, 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 Champion Ford, for instance, and get your air conditioner fixed, right? You're welcome. So, um, why are they bad? Well, one of them is the carbon, like she just said. I'm working on it. Okay, here we go. I gotta get ready of that hole in the ozone layer. You know, that's some serious stuff. That's not a thing anymore. What? It's gone? Howdy, Chlorofrendicarbons. You've found your way to D News. Thanks for that.
Welcome, I'm Trace. If you are a millennial, you've probably spent your whole life hearing about the hole in the ozone layer. Before you can understand the hole, though, you gotta know what the ozone layer is. The ozone layer isn't really its own thing. Instead, 90% of our ozone floats around in the stratosphere, about 6 to 30 miles above our heads. Ozone is three oxygen atoms linked together, O3. When in the stratosphere, ozone absorbs harmful UVB radiation, protecting us and other life here on the ground in the troposphere. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, people were just beginning to harness the power of refrigeration using toxic gases like ammonia, methyl chloride, and sulfur dioxide. In 1928, an enterprising inventor at General Motors created a non-toxic chemical for refrigeration called CFC, chlorofluorocarbon. It was patented as Freon by DuPont and sold in air conditioners, fridges, bug sprays, spray paints, hair conditioners, and healthcare products. At its peak, companies were making a million metric tons of CFCs every year. Sure, at sea level, CFCs are non-toxic and safe for humans, but if they get into the upper atmosphere, they're subject to photodissociation, where UV radiation breaks a chlorine atom off the CFC. If that free chlorine finds a molecule of ozone, O3, it will react with it, destroying the ozone by ripping off one of its oxygen atoms to make chlorine monoxide, leaving regular old O2 or oxygen in its wake. Then the chlorine monoxide gets hit by UV and broke up again, so it has to find another O3 molecule to try and stabilize it and the cycle repeats itself. It's bad. In 1977, we were studying the ozone layer and it was fine. By 1981, there were hints that something was amiss. Then in 1984, scientists suddenly registered a giant hole in the ozone layer. They published their findings and in 1987, the Montreal Protocol was signed beginning the phasing out of CFCs shortly thereafter. Meanwhile, even though the house was clearly on fire, DuPont and other companies insisted everything was fine and fought tooth and nail to keep CFCs legal. But they finally relented after scientific evidence became indisputable. A looming environmental disaster that pitted corporations against the scientific community. Where have I heard that before? Those CFCs can hide in the atmosphere for 40 to 150 years. Without the emission of new CFCs, eventually that free chlorine cycle will stop. If the chlorine runs into some methane up there, it would break up, forming hydrogen chloride, which is stable enough to rain back down to Earth. In 2015, about 30 years after the protocol was signed, the ozone hole reached the largest size ever. But since that peak, due mostly to volcanic eruptions that spew bromine and other ozone-depleting gas, scientists have finally started to see the ozone layer repair itself. A study published in Science this year found the hole had decreased in size from the year 2000, and most of that decrease was specifically because of the Montreal Protocol international policy for the win. Without the chlorine wafting up into the stratosphere, ozone is able to form naturally when UV light breaks up regular old oxygen from O2 into O3. Without that chlorine to mess it up, this process could restart. It can still be messed up by volcanic eruptions, but overall, without our meddling, the ozone layer may someday be back to normal. Based on this new study, the ozone layer might be back to 1980 levels by 2040. You can actually see how the ozone layer is doing right now on NASA's website. We will put the link in the description for you. Of course, this is science, so we can't all have happy endings. We still need ACs and fridges, and the replacement gas, HFCs, are a potent greenhouse gas. So now global warming is a concern. <sighs> we can never win. But hey, at least a thing that we were fighting for as kids is now getting better, right? But why is there air in the first place? I mean, that's my question. Luckily, we did a video about it. Our atmosphere came into being not long after the Earth cooled 4.6 billion years ago. Okay. So again, hopefully now you're getting it, chlorofluorocarbons, that chlorine comes out and, and does its damage. Um, so is chlorofluorocarbons the only ozone dis uh, destroyer? Nope. So we have halons, we have hydrobromofluorocarbons, we have methyl bromide, we have hydrogen chloride, we have carbon tetrachloride, we have methyl chloroform, we have impropoxyl bromide, we have hexochlorobutadiene. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, right, I did too. So, um, nope, that's not the only one. You just can't take one out. It's like Hydra. You know, you cut the head off and two heads sprung out in its place. So, but we are doing a good job of taking care of that. So, why should we worry about it? Well, first of all, your favorite topic, yourself. Um, I can tell you that 
I did very dumb things when I was your age. Um, I think I talked to you guys about how I was a lifeguard and we had sun tanning competitions. It's so dumb. I can remember setting out on the lifeguard chairs um, at Window Hollow and I would put iodine in my baby oil and not a dare raise an umbrella for shade. Like, why would you do that? And my ID at the University of Kentucky, my freshman year, I looked like a Hawaiian. Like, for real, could have been a hula girl. So, I am just prayerful that that does not come back and bite me in the hiney um, now. So, eye cataracts, sunburn, skin cancers, all bad, bad, bad. This gets a little bit more in depth about the ozone. So things, of course, the first thing you look at when you look at this picture is your eyes are immediately drawn to the polar bear and what's going on there. So I picked this picture because there's a ton of stuff going on. Like you've got down here in number two, right? All of the, see the circle? It's got a little number two in it. You've got all of these little microscopic organisms. So you've got photosynthesis, number three, happening all up in there. Um, we've got the producers, consumers, we've got primary, secondary, tertiary consumers all in there. Um, pretty sure we got stuff dying and, and um, settling for future oil in, you know, in the next four billion years. So, the resulting increase in UV radiation reaching the planet's surface could impair or destroy phytoplankton, especially in the Arctic waters. So remember, the phytoplankton... Phyto um, are the marine plants that play the key role in removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well as forming the base of the ocean food web. So you've got like two huge hits right there, right? Without the phytoplankton, number one, photosynthesis, right? Like we got to get carbon dioxide out of the water for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, let's just stop at a lot of reasons. And then the second is... We've got to have a food web, aquatic food web. Like we, if we let that, mm -mm, it's not going to be good. Okay, the Montreal Protocol and then the Copenhagen Amendment. I want to say that this summer we talked about the Montreal Protocol is still fair game for AP exam, but the Copenhagen Amendment is not. So I feel like your book, well, obviously your book, um, talked about the Copenhagen Amendment, but I do want you to know about the Montreal Protocol. Oh, gosh. We're going to get through this. Ever. Indeed, it may be one of the greatest success stories of any sort of negotiations on this planet. In our long history, there is one unprecedented act of humanity in which every country on Earth came together to protect the future of life on Earth. The Montreal Protocol The story of the Montreal Protocol is in some ways also the story of the 20th century. Something that was a great invention, namely a chemical chlorofluorocarbon had unintended consequences that suddenly became a planetary problem. It all began with a good idea. In the 1920s, coolants in refrigerators were so toxic that a leak could kill you. So we invented safer chemicals to do the job, CFCs. The wonder chemicals of the 20th century. They were so versatile, people's lives were transformed. But in 1974, Sherwood Rowland and Mario Molina predicted that the Earth's natural sun shield, the ozone layer, was being eaten by CFCs at a terrifying rate. We felt a great responsibility to actually warn society that something could happen. All eyes turned to the ozone layer. And sure enough, there was an enormous hole in the stratosphere. It was such a shocking revelation 
over half the ozone layer destroyed above Antarctica in a decade. If the destruction wasn't stopped, we'd be at risk from lethal levels of UV radiation. We'd be in dead trouble. We'll have a blind, burnt population. Faced with this global threat, the world came together to take action. And in 1987, more than 30 countries agreed to phase out the production of CFCs and signed the Montreal Protocol. Over the three decades since, the rest of the world's nations have signed up. Together, they've taken on the greatest planetary repair job ever attempted. It's absolutely terrifying to work on a project that's so important because you know that failure is not an option. Making the Montreal Protocol a success has taken brilliant minds. We are working to protect human life. It has taken determination. It has made more progress than any other environmental convention in the world. If the countries of the world engaged in similar deliberations for every issue that faces our world, I would be very happy. And it has taken ingenuity from an extraordinary global community. We always have our disagreement, and at the end of the day we have our agreement. And it has worked. With CFC's band, the ozone hole is healing. Now it's time to take action again. You need passion, you need leadership to change the Montreal Protocol into an even better treaty. Victory is within our grasp. There's only one earth. We have only one earth to protect. We cannot lose this one. Once more, we must come together to protect the future of our planet. To you, the delegates, and as somebody who considers himself part of the Montreal Protocol family, as you meet in Gigali, look to history, remember where the Montreal Protocol started off from, and please help the world to take the next step. There is need for everybody to compromise, but sometimes out of small steps towards one another, big things can happen. And you, as a family of the Montreal Protocol, have demonstrated that time and time again. Okay, that was way better than I thought it was going to be. Um, see, I pick the videos. Um, so, uh, Luke asked a great question, which was if if it were to completely disappear, uh, the ozone were completely to disappear over Antarctica, would the rest of it be um, rendered useless? And no, it would still be ozone. It would still do what it's supposed to do. But let's flesh out the question. So over Antarctica, that's where our polar ice caps are. So take another step in your thought process. Ozone blocks what? Right, UVA, UVB, and UVC rays. So without the protection, all of that is gonna yes, it's gonna get it's gonna directly hit our planet right there on a solar ice cap. So that's gonna have global implications for all of us. Um, we wouldn't suffer necessarily, like we would, our bodies would still be protected if we were to walk out in Kentucky from the UV rays, but the implications of Antarctica no longer having an ozone would be pretty intense. Um, I would think with just, <laughs> with just, you know, that whole melting of the polar ice caps thing being a big problem for us. So, hydrofluorocarbons were used to replace chlorofluorocarbons, and they turned out to be a greenhouse gas. <laughs> so, um, there's actually two sides to this story as well. So, let's pause and identify the difference between 
an ozone gas and a greenhouse gas. So ozone is just ozone. A lot of people confuse and they think that the ozone is the greenhouse. That is not the case, right? So our greenhouse gases um, are actually trapping the heat here on the planet, not protecting us from UV rays. So those are two totally different functions that happen. Um, so that's one problem, is that we've replaced an ozone eater with a greenhouse gas. So that's terrible. Um, the second is um, HFCs are way more expensive. So guess what happened to all of the products that were previously using chlorofluorocarbons? That's right, they all went up because we had to replace them. Um, you know, like there are, I'm sure there are still refrigerators in service today that are using chlorofluorocarbons as a coolant. Um, and just as those move through society, we will, you know, get rid of them. But those people are replacing when those refrigerators go bad with hydrofluorocarbons. So that's, yes. So a hydrofluorocarbon molecule can be up to 10,000 times more potent in warming the atmosphere than a molecule of CO2 is currently. So that's why Michael Scott screams no, right? Like, heaven's sakes. We are pulling the bubble gum out of one hole and sticking a smaller piece of bubble gum in a bigger hole. Um, so let me back up and tell you, uh, we are in our infancy as far as all of this information, all of this technology. So again, to go back to the archaic times of when I was younger, they basically we're like, no, carbon dioxide is the devil. It is the devil. It is going to kill us all. That, that is the devil. Um, only to find out carbon dioxide's not so bad, right? Like uh, the HCFs, way scarier, right? Methane, way scarier. So HCFs account for 2% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned that global use of HGCs is growing rapidly. Um, U.S. government asked the U.N. to intact a mandatory reduction in HFC emissions through the Montreal Protocol. I'm going to assume. Yeah, that should say HFCs, not HGCs. Um, and there's a growing... Uh, uh, I, Ella, I don't know if there is a replacement for HFCs. I'm sure there is. Uh, hopefully, we're kind of figuring out that this whole let's just react so quickly and replace everything may not always be in our best interest, and we may need to see what we're replacing it with. And it's just tough, right? Because... I, I don't believe that the men and the women that are creating these things believe it's bad. I believe that they are, are doing this for the betterment of all mankind. And yet, here we are. Um, some people, you know, argue, do we go back and start using CFCs again? And then kind of do the whole teeter-totter thing. I don't know. Maybe. We'll have to see. We'll have to see where this kind of ends. Uh, there is a growing consensus among scientists that the Montreal Protocol should also be used to regulate the greenhouse gas nitric oxide, uh, nitrous oxide. Sorry. So this is our fertilizers, our livestock manure. It contain it remains in the troposphere for about a hundred years, and then migrates to the stratosphere where it can destroy ozone. So again, what the what this slide is talking about is so we're arguing that we should put more regulations on farms and farmers. Uh, which, <laughs> so a lot of these memes are the how I was feeling when I was reading all this stuff. So progress in reducing ozone depletion could be set back. Um, oh, okay. Um, by the projected climate change, scientists from John Hopkins University reported in 2009 on their discovery that was warm that the warming of the troposphere makes the stratosphere cooler, which slows down the rate of ozone repair. Thus, the atmosphere warms and the global climate changes. The ozone levels may take much longer to return to where they were before ozone thinning began, or they may never really recover completely at all. So, 
that's how I feel about <laughs> all of that. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know, Mama June. Like, <laughs> it's a lot, guys, isn't it? Landmark international agreements on dealing with stratospheric ozone depletion now signaled by all of the 190 uh, now signed by all 196 of the world's countries are important examples of global cooperation in response to serious <laughs> environmental problems. So, if all of the nations continue to follow these agreements while acting to slow the rate of climate change, change, change we could be back to where we were by 2068, which, um, you know, yeah, I might see that, um, uh, <laughs> 1950 levels by 2108, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not banking on seeing that one, okay, The great enemy of writing isn't your own lack of talent, it's being interrupted by other people. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is AP Environmental Sciences. Video 33, it's on stratospheric ozone, or good ozone. We call it good because it protects us against ultraviolet radiation. This person's skin doesn't look like it has much damage, but if we look at it with UV radiation, you start to see blemishes, freckles pop out right away. And if you were to take a picture of my face or somebody who's much older than me, there's going to be more damage due to ultraviolet radiation. So we should wear sunscreen. What sunscreen does, you can see it on the left side of this person's face, is absorb that ultraviolet radiation protects us from the ravages of ultraviolet radiation. Thankfully, our planet is wrapped in sunscreen. It's wrapped in this ozone layer. Protects us especially from UVC radiation. Why is that important? Well, until we had an ozone layer on our planet, until we had an appreciable atmosphere, life couldn't exist on land. All life had to be in the oceans. But once we had the ozone layer, it protected us. The problem is with industrialization, we started to produce chemicals like CFCs. They release chlorine into the atmosphere, and what they do is they destroy ozone. So this is a simulation of what would have happened if we didn't stop using uh, these CFCs over time. This is a NASA prediction. So you can see here on the bottom that over time by 2020, by 2040, by the time we get to 2060, essentially all of that ozone is gone. All of that protection is gone as well. And so ozone is simply oxygen. Instead of being oxygen, diatomic oxygen, two atoms of oxygen, it's actually three atoms of oxygen connected together. It's found in two layers in our atmosphere. In the troposphere, we call that the bad ozone because it leads to pollution. Smog, for example, is produced through ozone. But what I'm talking about is the good ozone, the stratospheric ozone that forms the o ozone layer that protects us on this planet, protects us from ultraviolet radiation. Now, some of that gets through. Uh, that ultraviolet radiation is ordered from A to B to C in ascending energy and also descending wavelength. The UVA radiation moves right through the ozone layer. But this is not too damaging. If you've ever looked at a, a black light, that's UVA radiation. Most of the UVB is filtered out and all of the UVC, the most damaging type of ultraviolet radiation, is filtered out by the stratospheric ozone. The nice thing about that UVC radiation is that when it's hit, regular oxygen forms ozone, which can then be broken down again. So we have this nice feedback cycle. As long as the sun is shining, as long as we have ultraviolet radiation, radiation, we're producing ozone to protect us. The problem is we started producing chemicals like chlorofluorocarbons, which released chlorine into the atmosphere. And what it does is it acts as an enzyme to break down that ozone. And so we had the hole in the ozone layer. You're probably familiar with that. It would have gotten larger if we didn't do something to stop it. And so in 1989, the Montreal Protocol was put forward as a way to limit CFCs in our, on our planet. So if we look at the amounts of ozone on this graph, this is going to be right near the surface of the Earth. We're going to have large amounts near the surface, and it's going to drop off, and then we're going to have large amounts as we go, you know, kilometers away from the surface. This near the bottom is called tropospheric ozone. This is that bad ozone. It can create smog, also leads to lung irritation, can lead to things like lung cancer. As we move farther and farther up, we get into the stratospheric ozone. That's the ozone we're talking about. This is the ozone layer, large amounts of ozone high in the atmosphere. It's this O3 molecule. It doesn't start as an O3 
free molecule. We basically have a bunch of regular oxygen, diatomic oxygen. It's hit by ultraviolet radiation and it breaks it apart into two atoms of oxygen. This free atom of oxygen bonds to diatomic oxygen and now we've got our ozone. That's how it's formed. We need the radiation to form the ozone. It's also how it breaks down. So if it's hit by another bit of UV radiation, then it breaks out again and now we're doing this cycle. We're doing this cycle of solar formation when we take regular oxygen, hit it with a photon, break it into these free atoms, which then bond to another oxygen atom to make ozone, and then we have solar breakdown. That's when we have the ozone, it's hit with a photon, we break it down, and then we make that good old-fashioned oxygen again. And so it's a nice cycle. As long as the sun is shining, we're going to have ozone. And the importance of ozone is protection. So if we look at the amount of UV radiation, it moves right through those layers in our atmosphere. UV, UVB is mostly filtered out, and UVC is completely filtered out. And you might think, why is that? Well, it has to do with the wavelength of that radiation. Um, thankfully, the radiation's wavelength fits that oxygen bond. It's able to break it apart, and it's able to make that ozone. Now, the problem is we started producing things like chlorofluorocarbons. What is a chlorofluorocarbon? If we just break down the word, it's three chlorine atoms. So that's the chloro part. We then have the fluoro part, so it's one fluorine atom, and then we have a carbon atom. And what happens when chlorofluorocarbons are hit by radiation is it breaks off a chlorine atom. Now watch what happens to that chlorine atom. It grabbed one of the atoms from an ozone. So if we look at the atmosphere, we've got a lot of ozone at this point, but now that we've freed up that chlorine, it grabs another one, it grabs another one, it grabs another one, and so what it's doing is it's breaking down all that ozone. It's acting as an enzyme. It's not consumed in the reaction, it simply breaks down the ozone. And one chlorine atom can break down a hundred thousand ozone atoms. And so it goes really, really quickly. And that led to the ozone hole. Now why is that ozone hole found on the pole? Remember, there's going to be an area where we're not having a lot of light. There's not a lot of radiation, so we can't build that ozone back up. And so we started to see it here first, but it would have spread across the whole planet. And so what humans did is they got together and they formed the Montreal Protocol. It's a treaty that all of these countries were signing and they said we have to stop using these CFCs. And so if you look at where we were headed with the amount of CFCs we were producing, things in Freon for example, aerosols for example, we were leading to a destruction of the ozone layer. But thanks to the Montreal Protocol we've dropped off the amount of CFCs in the environment and over time that ozone is going to build itself up again. And so did you learn the following? Could you pause the video at this point and fill in the blanks? Well, let me do it for you. Ozone, remember, is O3 rather than O2. It mostly filters out UVC radiation, but also filters some of the UVB. This is ozone found in the stratosphere, or stratospheric ozone. CFCs release chlorine, which formed the ozone hole. Thankfully, the, the Montreal Protocol uh, helped to avoid that. And the misconception you want to avoid is that we're not talking about tropospheric ozone, this polluting ozone near the atmosphere. We're talking about that protective, good ozone high in the atmosphere and I hope that was helpful. Can you hear that? Nothing can truly survive in a palm oil plantation. It's barren, there are no animals, insects or birds here. What about now? What about now? All right, and that's the big ideas. So we have made it. Let me get back up here. Um, uh, do the clouds stop UV light like the ozone? No, but they are going to um, help, but definitely not. Um, Okay, so outdoor air pollution, indoor air pollution, do be sure that you are picking up on whether we're talking about outdoor air pollution or indoor air pollution. Um, hopefully it makes sense to you that our pollution is going to increase both out, outdoors and indoors with the increase of just, you want to come here? You want to come here? Um, which is the increase of the human head count, right? Um, when you couple the increase in the human head count with 
our industrial advancements that we have made, then it's, you know, it's, it's going to get bigger. Um, good news to take away is we keep finding things to fix things. The bad news is a lot of times the things we find to fix the things also have things that need to be fixed. See if you can say that three times real fast. And um, but we'll keep we'll keep moving at we'll keep moving in that direction. Um, air quality is directly related to your health. Prolonged exposure to air pollution definitely is related to your overall health. And we're all breathing the same air. That's one of the biggest, big ideas that you can have is that understand the steps that we are taking with the Paris Accord Agreement, the Montreal Protocol, those kinds of things. The steps that we are taking are great things. But the things like the Asian brown clouds that are coming from other places, we're all imagine the atmosphere is like a balloon, right? So if you blow a little bit of smoke in a balloon, it's all still in there. Um, does the ozone take away breathable oxygen? I'm going to say no to that. Like, I get what you're saying. I don't think that's a dumb question uh, because it's the O2s that are being broken apart and then one grabs for an O3. Um, but at this point, our rate of photosynthesis is doing just fine with making um, oxygen available for us. See, that wasn't a dumb question. Uh, so, tomorrow, we're going to test over this chapter and um, I fully expect there to be something wrong with it. The rest of you guys are just suffering through what first block has come accustomed to knowing which is there's going to be a mistake or two in there. Uh, so I look forward to your 7,000 emails all telling me about you know <laughs> that mistake. If there is a mistake I do want to know um, so that I can fix it, and um, clearly, I'm not going to let your grades suffer. Hopefully, we're all back in a place of, you know, I realized that the carpet got pulled out from under us, and we all felt a little scared there for a little while. Yes, very good, Caleb. It is all in the stratosphere anyway, which is, we're breathing, oh, for heaven's sakes, we breathe troposphere, right? So, um, so anyway... So test tomorrow. Uh, that's all you'll have to do all day. Is there a specific time that the test needs to be done? Yes, I will open it tomorrow morning. And then I, I will probably set like, you know, from, I don't know, 8 a.m. to midnight or something. You know, I'm not going to leave it open for the whole weekend this time, I don't think. Um, I think I'll just keep it open for Friday. I may even do something crazy and like open it late tonight so that you guys have 24 hours to work on it if you are the night owl and that makes you nervous so yeah we need to do it tomorrow all right as we i'm just trying to watch and see what other questions i need to answer um as always i'm continuing to pray for you guys i'm continuing to pray for um your your health and the health of your families. Yeah, I would like for you guys to get the Unit 2 AP progress checks done by then. Okay, I thought it was going to be open for like an hour or something. No, no. No, I'm not going to do... There are teachers that are doing timed AP tests still. I'm just not one of them. So, my thoughts are that's just going to cause everybody's anxiety to go up. Meaning, you know, how much computer problem can ensue in that 84-minute time period that I open it up. So, no, you're going to have just all day for you to get on it when you can get on it. There are some of you all um, that are fighting for hot spots. There are some of you guys that have to find ways to um, a school parking lot for you to set in and take your tests and do that kind of stuff. So I want to be as lenient as possible with you on that. Okay. All right. It looks like you guys are doing pretty good. I'm proud of you. Uh, you all are coming in, coming in well. I go back and I look at the videos and see how many views and almost all of them have had, you know, somewhere around 70 some odd views, which is exactly 
where we want them to be. So I just want to keep encouraging you. If you can't be with us live or you don't want to be with us live, then um, I'm glad you're still watching the videos. Uh, test is done. Next chapter we're going to is chapter 15 after spring break. So um, I don't anticipate doing another show. Show, do you like that? Um, until after spring break. If something comes up and we got to talk and we got to do this again, we'll do this again over spring break. That'll be fine too. But for now, for today, for right now, I think that um, this is going to wrap us up until after spring break. I don't know anything else as far as AP World goes. April the 3rd. We're, oh, I did want to tell you this. Um, so my AP Central people... Thanks, Kaylee. My AP Central people are going to create a, and I'm going to post it for you, um, kyap2020.com forward slash events forward slash. So we're going to go to that website, kyap2020 dot com forward slash events forward slash um, I'll post it let's see I'll read it to you as mentioned yesterday advanced Kentucky will be offering online review sessions for all AP science classes free of charge beginning Monday April the 6th these sessions will be similar to the college board's YouTube classes which Caleb and I kind of looked at um, there were, we, we've had some discussions about those, um, but provide more student engagement by allowing them to interact with the presenter. Each session will have student support handouts to accompany them as well. Please encourage all students as well as you to take advantage of this unique opportunity. Go to kyap2020.com forward slash events forward slash for schedule of dates and times, topics, presenters, and access to the Zoom meetings. We are going to do that. Um, these, these are the people that know the people that know the people. So we're going to do that. Uh, we have uh, just sucks that we lost the opportunity to be a part of that uh, practice group. But, uh, but yeah, but we're going to be a part of that meeting. And, um, and we're all going to practice and it's going to be good. So I will post that. That's not until April the 6th. Today is like March the 26th. So everybody breathe, right? We don't need 7,000 anxiety attacks, you know, simultaneously. Um, let me look at my calendar. April the 6th is, so that is the Monday we come back from spring break. Right? Well, is, is when it starts. That's when we're going to... Um, so, I'll post this today in our Google Classroom. And we'll be ready to go after spring break for some practice sessions. And we'll work on it from there. And you guys just continue to keep working through those units. Right? You got one, two, three, four weeks. That's up to unit six. If you don't do a unit during spring break, seven. Okay, we're perfect. If you do a unit a week on AP Central, you are gonna land perfectly before um, the AP exam. And that's God's timing, that's not my timing, or the God of your understanding, or the lack thereof, right? Like, that's just, you know, the big guy taking care of y'all. Because uh, we all know, you know, I'm not that good. So, we're going to practice, we're going to practice, we're going to practice, we're going to keep getting better, and we're just, we're going to do a great job, guys. We are going to do it. You are going to do it. You're going to do so well. All right, so, uh-oh, I was like, I don't see any further questions. That's because I have, oh, that's your aunt's birthday. Okay, well, good. All right, so, I love y'all. Um, it's, it, everything's going to be good. We got this, uh, you know, um. Here's my, look at this. Oh, that's not mine. Oh, you know, I suck. Oh, here it is. Okay. All right. So, um, love y'all. We're going to do great. See you after spring break.